My daughter Eva was applying for a fellowship and she was getting advice from a friend, a fellow 17 year old about how she should speak in this interview. And her friend said to her that whatever question she was asked, she would respond saying, I reject the premise of that question. <laughs> and she said, if you simply do that, they won't ask you to elaborate on it, but they'll know you're smart. So anyway, when, when Eva told us this story, we all rolled our eyes. And yet we realized that on some level, we kind of resonated to the idea like, are you religious or are you modern? I reject the premise of that question. Do you like good food or are you vegan? I reject the premise of that question. Should rabbis preach politics from the pulpit? I completely reject the premise of that question. Are you pro-choice or pro-life? Like, what are you talking about? I reject the premise of that question. Are you pro-Israel or are you pro-Palestine? I totally reject the premise of that question. I wanna invite us to look at this week's Torah portion and, and last to see what kind of wisdom might be speaking to us from the ages to hold these complicated times when we might fundamentally reject the premise of the questions that we are being asked in these difficult days. So last week we began reading Sefer Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, Parshat Bamidbar. And it's really a, a, a pretty dry recitation of the placements of each of the tribes of Israel in their desert encampments. So you'll read about how Judah encamps to the east and Reuven to the south, how Ephraim encamps to the west and Don to the north. And each person, each person camps with their designated tribe. There are no outliers. There are no divergence. There are no factionless in this scenario, each tribe. And they wave banners with insignias, colored flags to mark their camp. Each one a part of a community with a sense of purpose. And a few years ago, as I opened up Parshat Bamidbar in, a, in another particularly fraught moment, as I read about this dry description of these encampments, I actually started to cry. And the reason I cried is because I felt envious of these people who fit into a camp with a flag with insignias and had team colors. And I wondered what must it feel like to fit into a camp? What must it feel like to live very comfortably in someone else's absolutes? And what happens to a person who rejects the absolute, someone who's able to see the truths of multiple camps and therefore feels kind of politically and socially homeless wherever they go? Where do the people go who try to honor competing narratives, who try to cultivate hearts that are capacious enough to hold multiple truths, who know that there is very likely another way to tell every single story they hear. And nothing, nothing more than Israel-Palestine and the struggle in that holy land elicits this feeling. And I know that I'm not alone here. I know that with every conflagration, massive rifts emerge within families, between friends, within communities, right and left becomes right and wrong or wrong and right, victim and villain. And it leaves some of us, I think in this community, a lot of us feeling not only great anguish and despair, but also a sense of loneliness. And so what I wanna do for a few moments today before we transition to our celebration and to this time of joy is I wanna to speak to the lonely. You who know where you stand right now, I see you, I envy you on some level and you're welcome to listen, but this sermon's really not for you. I really wanna talk this morning to those who are just torn apart after the last several weeks of violence and escalation in Israel, Palestine, I wanna to talk to those who are devastated by the completely avoidable and utterly horrific loss of life by the machinery of war. I wanna to talk to those among us who believe that what we witnessed this time was different. So 
Someone does not, again, want me giving this sermon. <laughs> It'll be over soon, folks. <laughs> To those who believe that what we witnessed this time around was different. Different in the way that the election of November 2016 was different. In that it called into question everything we thought we understood about American politics. Different in the way that the murder of George Floyd was different. Because it forced from the margins into the mainstream. Conversations about policing in America, about racial terror, about racial injustice that simply were not taking place in those spaces before. Different in the way that January 6th was different, in that it forced many of us to reckon with the true vulnerability of our democratic institutions. I want to speak to those who understand or who believe that what we've all just witnessed and experienced is different in the sense that what hit Israel over the course of the last two weeks was more than 3,500 or 4,000 rockets being shot in from Gaza by Hamas, but something far deeper and far more foundational now that must be reckoned with. I'm talking about those people who feel like we are watching in real time an entire house of cards collapse. I'm talking about those among us all around this country who got standalone emails from their day schools or from their synagogues or their federations or their JCRCs proclaiming that Israel was under attack and facing an existential threat and we as American Jews needed to stand with Israel and wondered, even as we worried for our own family and friends in Israeli bomb shelters, can you not spare a tear for the 66 Palestinian children who were killed in Gaza, buried under the rubble, some of them in their pajamas? Does your heart not break? Does your heart not break for the entire families who are wiped out in this war? For Abir Ashkontana, the 30-year-old mother who died alongside her three children, Yahya, Dana, and Zin, five, nine, and two years old, along with their two friends, Rula and Lana. Tell me, do you want us to look away? Do you want us to look away when we see that picture of that little Palestinian boy wailing at his 11-year-old brother's funeral, killed in an instant in an airstrike? Maybe you want us to become well rehearsed in the practice of turning the page or clicking to the next image, something that would make us feel a little bit less devastated. It's collateral damage, folks. It's collateral damage. And how dare you talk about root causes when rockets are falling? This is a moment for self-defense. I know that some of you believe right now that I am grossly and irresponsibly overstating the point. And yet, for many years, the boundaries of this camp, with its flags and insignia, have been well established. And orthodoxy was created here. I'm not talking about individual American Jews. I'm talking about an unelected, self-selected group of Jewish communal leaders who represent overall a rather small number of American Jews, but who set the agenda, who over the course of decades wrote the script that they demanded that the rest of us would follow. They took their lead from an increasingly right-wing government for decades while marginalizing the multitude of voices of dissent, both over there and here, as if determining for us too that we are not part of this story. The Palestinian issue was stricken from the agenda. We watched as an erosion of the standing and status of Arabs in Israel was excused and justified and explained away. We got uncomfortable here, sure, as we watched a slew of laws being passed that targeted Palestinian citizens of Israel, Israel's nation state law, the Nakba law, which we talked about last week. We watched as a former foreign minister called for the beheading of disloyal Arab citizens as the prime minister himself warned that Arabs were going to the polls in droves, 
as one of his advisors wrote, and then the justice minister retweeted, they are all enemy combatants and their blood shall be on all their heads. This minister's views, her views are so extreme that another member of Knesset wrote to give her the justice portfolio is like giving the fire and rescue services to a pyromaniac. And yet she served in that role for five years. Do you remember all of this? I have to say, I get a lot of email, but I missed a standalone that came from our mainstream organizations speaking out about that. And those who did speak out, those who among us who had a pulpit that was safe enough to preach from, those who spoke about the growing ethnic rage and the racism that was coursing through Israeli society were marginalized and delegitimized and called the radical left and called traitors and called anti-Israel. So where was the outcry? I think that our community leaders believed that they were acting out of love and loyalty and feared that they would turn young people away from Israel if they spoke openly about such things. Well, that was a Faustian bargain because it turns out that not talking about the infection that is spreading through the system only makes you sicker. And we left our friends and our allies, those Israelis and Palestinians whose values are shared by us to fight this fight alone without our funding and without our platform and without our support. Yep, we heard from the American Jewish establishment when the conversion bill was up for a vote. We heard when the same dishonest prime minister pulled back on his promises to women of the wall. But when it came to systemic moves to further privilege Jews over non-Jews in the land of Israel within and beyond the green line, there was silence. Had this moment not become so explosive these last couple of weeks, how many in the Jewish mainstream, how many of those flag wavers would have known or ever spoken the word Sheikh Jarrah, that East Jerusalem neighborhood that was part of the kindling of this latest conflagration? I'm not suggesting that they created this problem, but for too long, systems were built that accommodated this problem. Our institutions remained largely silent and justified every last desire of an increasingly right-wing ultranationalist agenda within the Israeli government. We didn't publicly confront, we didn't stand up and say, if you insist on this approach, we do not stand in common cause with you. Our, our values will not allow it. Instead, what did we do? <laughs> We welcomed those very members of Knesset who spoke most egregiously into our synagogues when they would come over to fundraise and to encounter the American Jewish community. Privately, we didn't like these things. Of course, we didn't. But publicly, a firewall was created to protect and to defend even those very ideas that make us sick to our stomach. I have to say that I love getting caught up in a crowd. I want to stand up and applaud and pretend that things are very, very simple. I want to pretend that there's a good guy and a bad guy, a victim and a villain, a clear right and a clear wrong. But that camp, that camp is not my home. And it never has been. And it certainly is not now. And I know what you're going to tell me. I know what you're going to say that the other camps are broken too, and you are right. Because Jews have been attacked in Los Angeles this week, and in New York City, and in London, and in other cities throughout the country and throughout the world. And Jews have been attacked not because we were defenders of these destructive policies or representatives of the administration responsible for making them or soldiers in a battlefield, or even because we knew anything about what was going on over there, but because we are Jews walking down the street or sitting down for sushi. And one of the ways that anti-Semitism works in the world is assuming that any one Jew speaks for all the Jews or assuming that the Israeli government speaks for all Jews. That is anti-Semitism. 
fact, we would, I think, do very well to recall the five useful markers laid out by my friend Rabbi Jill Jacobs to help us discern between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, one of them assuming that the Israeli government speaks for all Jews, two of them, two, seeing Jews as insidious influencers behind the scenes of world events, three, using the word Zionist as a code for Jew or Israeli, denying Jewish history, five, dismissing the humanity of Israelis. Thank you. Maybe you've come across some of these arguments over the past few days. It's not good. And yet I have heard very little from the camp that cries out of the most vulnerable, that speaks truth to power when there are hate crimes and when there are acts of violence. <laughs> it's been very quiet. <laughs> so it turns out that. <laughs> I know what the good mic is. I'm going. <laughs> I, as I've said, we all know where the power lies in this community. It's, I've got the God mic now. <laughs> I'm going to go back to our ancestors in their desert encampments. What happened to the people who didn't fit into any camp? Well, you know that there is one tribe, the Levites, who were not part of the formation. They did not receive an encampment in the desert and they didn't fight for one. Instead, they recognized that they belonged to all camps and to none. That in order to see the truth and the humanity everywhere, they could not be contained by one camp or one ideology that would be so vulnerable to absolutist forms. The rest of the people were counted in the census last week in Parshat Bamidbar. This week in Parshat Naso, the Levites themselves are counted. These are the ones who have no flag to wave. They have no home, but they do have purpose. La avod avodab ohel moed, to do the holy work of their camp, to carry the cloths of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, to, to, to carry the coverings of dolphin skin, the screen for the entrance, to perform the sacred service in this, the holiest of sites. I wanna ask you to think for a moment of what that means, that those who stood without a camp are those who are called to do the holiest of work in the community. Stav Shafir, a member of Knesset, called this week on Jewish and Arab moderates to make an alliance of the sane, she said, to counter the alliance of extremists, which seems to be now conspiring to destroy everyone. Leah Solomon, a friend, a Jew who lives in Jerusalem and runs Encounter, a project that many of us have been part of now for years, rejects the us-them binary with these words. She said, recognizing and grieving the suffering and deaths of both Palestinians and Israelis is not about both sideism. It's not about being wishy-washy or avoiding moral clarity. It is certainly not about providing aid and comfort to the enemy or betraying my own. It is, she writes, rather about a paradigm shift. It's about refusing the entire false binary model of both sides, refusing to view pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian as contradictory stances, refusing the formula that claims that this is a zero-sum game of us and them in which either we win or they do. And after reading Leah Solomon, I spoke this week with Suli Khatib, a Palestinian friend who lives in Beit Lechem. I spoke to him in advance of his book talk, which he'll be doing with our community this Thursday. He wrote a new book called In This Place Together, in which he wrote about and he shared with me again on Friday, the way that certain foundations that he had rested on his entire life felt shaken when he opened his heart and grew willing to look not only at Israeli narratives, but at his own Palestinian narratives from a different angle. I think about that, Stav and Leah and Suli and the millions of other people who are without a camp. And last week I quoted Amos Oz and I will again today, 
because he told a story that for us is a guide for the people who live between and without camps. He said, I believe that if one person is watching a huge calamity, let's say a conflagration, there are always three principal options. Option one, run away as far and as fast as you can and let those who can't run be burned. Option two, write an angry letter to the editor of your paper demanding that the responsible people be removed from office in disgrace or for that matter, launch a demonstration. Option three, bring a bucket of water and throw it on the fire. And if you don't have a bucket, bring a glass. And if you don't have a glass, bring a teaspoon. Everyone has a teaspoon. And yes, I know a teaspoon is little, he said, and the fire is huge, but there are millions of us and each of us has a teaspoon. So now he writes, I would like to establish the order of the teaspoon. People who share my attitude, not the runaway attitude, but the teaspoon attitude. I would like them to walk around wearing a little teaspoon on the lapel of their jackets so that we know that we're in the same movement, in the same brotherhood and sisterhood, in the same order, the order of the teaspoon. This is my philosophy in a nutshell or in a teaspoon, if you wish. These days as we grapple with impossible choices. I ask us to remember that it is absolutely an honor to be counted among those who reject the absolutes, to stand in the coalition of the sane, to be a part of the order of the teaspoon, to be like those like the Levites who live without a camp because they do not fit, because they refuse to choose between their loyalty to their own people and their loyalty to all people because they reject the premise of the question, because they see the humanity and the rightness and the righteousness everywhere, because they know that the holy work that they, that we are called to do will be drowned out by the limitations of the extremist camps that stand before us. These are people who don't have easy answers, but we do have clear values. And this is what I hope we will hold in the days ahead, that we don't fit into one camp or another. But when we stand together, we are never standing alone. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom, a Shabbat of peace. Amen.